2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're continuing verse by verse here, uh, and we're going to pick up in verse 12 of 2 Corinthians 2. And if you're newer with us, uh, maybe you're, you've never really done a study through the Bible like this, what we're reading when we read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is we're reading someone else's mail. And so uh, it's First and Second Corinthians is a collection of correspondence, uh, one side of it, from Paul to this church in Corinth that he planted, that he started there in the, in the city of Corinth. And we've talked about how uh, the city is eerily similar to our own. They have the same views and ideas when it came to education and the value of that and, 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 and sexuality and, and all of those things and uh, focusing on, on wealth, all of, all of those attributes that could be found in first century Corinth are things that reverberate in our own time. And so we've been able to make a lot of parallels through first Corinthians and now into second Corinthians. But Paul spent a year and a half in the city of Corinth, starting this church. He first went to the synagogue. He, he began this church, but after a year and a half, he continued on his pioneering missionary uh, venture and, and efforts and, and moved on from there, but he still had a heart for this church. He didn't begin it and just abandon them. He still wanted them to flourish in their relationship with the Lord. And, and so from the time that he planted it to the time of 2 Corinthians, he has sent uh, missionaries on his behalf to go check on them, uh, Titus being one that we're going to talk about today. He's written several letters, not just two, but several letters we, we know back and forth to them. He himself has visited and, and dropped in. And through all of this, yet they're, they're doubting his heart for them. And, and they that he really would care for this young church. And so, so far, as we're just kind of getting into 2 Corinthians, really, he's just been explaining his change in travel plans. He didn't see them when he said he was going to, and, and so he doesn't have to, to give an explanation for that, but he does. And, and, uh, and then he's been explaining to them, this is what genuine ministry looks like. And so, and then the verses we looked at last week, if you were here, we were in chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. He referred back to the situation with a man that he talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And if you, if you were with us, if you remember, there was this man that was an unrepentant sexual sin. And Paul's letter, he'd said, you've got to correct this. You've got to make the necessary move. You've got to be proactive in this. And it's for his good. It's out of a heart of love. But you've got to confront this issue. And the church finally did listen to them. They, they did follow up his advice, and, and it was effective. The man turned. He was repentant. He, he was sorry. But the new problem then revealed itself is that the church wouldn't let up. They, they let this guy not only he, he go from conviction of sin, which is good, but then on to condemnation. And he was feeling just burdened by this himself. And so uh, Paul said, you can't leave him there. If he's repentant, you got to forgive him. He said in verse 11, 2 Corinthians uh, 2 verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Paul gives this incredible warning. And I'll tell you, even through this week, I was still, my mind was going back to this warning that Paul talks about here, that failing to genuinely forgive one another is a very real way that the enemy can gain a foothold in our life. Just, just being unforgiving is something that the enemy wants to use. And so Paul says, you got to forgive this guy. You can't leave him out there. You got to bring him back. You got to forgive him. You got to restore him again. And, uh, and so you, you can't, uh, this, this forgiveness is at the heart of the gospel. It's what the Lord did for us, and it's what we pass on to other believers. And so as we come to now to chapter 12, that kind of catches us up. Paul is now going to explain that he's been anxiously waiting to hear how the Corinthians were doing. Because uh, last time he saw them, there was an unexpected visit there that he dropped in. He, he called it, we'll, we'll see later on, he's going to call it a painful visit that he made because there was more correction that needed to be done. The last time he wrote a letter to him, which wasn't 1 Corinthians, there was one in between there, he, he called that a severe letter. And so now, 
He's had this painful visit. He's had this severe letter, and he's waiting to hear how Titus, who he sent to Corinth, to Corinth, where he's waiting to hear from them to see how all this has been received. And so that's the background. That picks us up. Verse 12, chapter 2. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. I think we have a map. Yes, no, maybe so. Oh, look at that. Great. Okay, so um, Tro, can you see Troas right next to the GNC there? It's just to the right. It's what we call you know, Troy, right? Troy and Sparta. Sparta is actually just south of Corinth in the southern part of Greece there. Uh, this is Sparta. But that is Troy. That is Troas up there. And so Paul, he went there, he said, with the intention of doing ministry for the sake of the gospel, he says. He wants to, and, and Aaron talked about Christianese earlier, the gospel is the good news. Christ is the Messiah. He wants to share the good news that there's a Savior, that there's a Messiah. And he says God was opening doors there in Troas. And that is where he had arranged to meet Titus with a report about how things were going in Corinth. Yet, verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit. This is the Apostle Paul talking. I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. And I think you can see Macedonia there on the top left. Titus was to bring this report back about how the Corinthians were, were doing to Troas. He was supposed to meet Paul there, and he didn't show up. And Paul's mind is reeling. I mean, let's take ourselves back there, okay? They, they couldn't text and like, hey, how are things going? He was supposed to show up. He didn't show up. Were things going that poorly in Corinth that Titus is like, man, I got to stay here a little bit longer and, and try to straighten this out? Or, or what, maybe Titus had been persecuted. Maybe he had been martyred. Paul doesn't know. But, but he, he, we look at this map, and you know that's uh, I, I checked it on Google Maps. It's about 220 miles to drive from uh, where Paul was in Ephesus up to Troas. It's about 220 miles or so, six hours. But this would have taken weeks for Paul to travel at the time. It's, it's actually pretty treacherous territory. And, and as I said, there's no updating on progress. You know, I get things on my phone telling me about I-90, you know. Is that getting worse like every weekend, it seems? Oh, the summer's almost over, thank goodness. But after all that travel, Paul, hey, I'm supposed to meet Titus in Troas. He's not there. His dear friend is not there, and he doesn't know what's going on in the city of Corinth. And so even though there's this open door, he says, uh, I have no rest here, he said. I have no rest. That word means no relaxing. It means he was anxious. Paul, the same apostle, the same guy that wrote, be anxious for nothing, says, I was anxious. I was troubled. He knew, that same guy who said, be anxious for nothing, he knew what it meant to be anxious, to be troubled. And, and I like that because I know what it's like to be anxious and, and troubled. But he says, I have no Titus. I have no update on my, uh, this church in Corinth. And so I have no rest. rest. There's no relaxing. And so he says, I left them. He left the people of Troas. He departed for Macedonia. And now what I want to do is, uh, if I could just have you hang on and put your, like my old teacher used to say when I was in grade school, put your thinking caps on for a moment. Paul's going to take a left-hand turn. And it's so fascinating to me. Therefore, I want it to be fascinating to you. So you have to, to bear with me. Keep a finger here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and then flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And when I say, if, after we sh I do all this, I say, isn't that amazing? You guys go, oh yeah, that was incredible. Thank you for showing us that. Because what I want to show you is that from here, 2 Corinthians 2.14 all the way to chapter 7, verse 5, Paul is on a rabbit trail. Paul is on a tangent. And so uh, you, you think I go on tangent sometime. Paul these, goes on a four-plus chapter parentheses. He, he interrupts his thought for four and a half chapters here or so. And so everybody got a finger in both places, 2 Corinthians 2 and uh, 2 Corinthians 7. And what I want to do is I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 2, 13, and then I'm going to jump straight to 7, verse 5, 6, and 7, okay? And, and you can see that 
Everything in between is really a parenthesis. Check this out. Chapter 2, 13. I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. 7, 5. For indeed, when I came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, and, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation or comfort with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I could rejoice even more. Paul goes on this four plus chapters later, he's, he's going to say, everything turned out great. I reconnected with Titus, uh, uh, my dear, you know, protege in the faith. Uh, I, I heard that you guys responded positive t- to me, but in the section in between where he is right now, the situation that I was in, I was troubled. I had anxiety. I couldn't rest. I had fear, he said. And so he takes this long moment to explain how he goes from this this momentary fear and defeat that he experienced to remember the ultimate triumph that he would have. And and what's interesting to point out and for us to remember ourselves, and uh, that's what I've entitled this message is, Uh, things for for the anxious Christian to remember, the troubled Christian or the fearful Christian, is he takes this moment, he he says, I'm not going to dwell on my feelings. They exist, okay? I'm not saying they don't exist, but I'm not dwelling on them, and I'm not going to get paralyzed by how things appear in my life right now. And and when I I get to to this situation, when I'm in this spot, what I'm going to do is turn my attention back to the Lord. Now look with me back at verse 14. So all of that, just this turmoil is going on inside of him, right? And he he says, here's the the reality that I'm going to focus on. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Paul leaves the feelings of anxiety, worry, despair, fear, and he makes a conscious decision to thank God. There's always something to thank God for okay? <laughs> we, we may find ourselves in these situations, but there's always something to thank God for. And as we, as we read in chapter 7, he's going to reconnect with Titus, and all that's great. They're gonna give a, he's going to give a positive report about Corinth, but that, he says, is not the primary source. It's not situational. That's not the primary source of my gratitude and thanks to God. It's not necessarily what, what's going on out there. It's, it's, this immaterial thing. I can be thankful in the middle of this difficult situation, regardless of what's going on outside of me, as he said in chapter 7, or inside of me, because I know that regardless of what's inside of me, I'm in Christ. And when I am in Christ, and I'm being led, as he says here, he allowed himself to to be led by God, he finds himself despite what's going on in the world and inside, in a place of victory. Guys, the Lord didn't call us, bless you, the Lord didn't call us to live a defeated life. Okay, can you let that sink in for a minute? Maybe you feel defeated, as Paul did. But he doesn't want you to to stay there. He, he, He doesn't, that's not the calling the Lord has for us. He called us to follow his leading, and when we do, that is when we can live a victorious, triumphal life in Christ. And what Paul is doing here, I don't want to take too much time on it, but he uses this very specific word triumph here. It's worth circling, putting a box around, underlining, whatever, because it's a word that describes a specific event in that culture. It described a Roman victory march. Okay, uh, a Roman triumphal processional. And so in the first century, the most highly bestowed honor a Roman general could receive was a victory parade in his honor. Now before this, he, he couldn't just go out there and, and start a parade himself. There are some criteria for him to meet in order for this parade to take place. This is so fitting, right? Labor Day weekend, we just had our parade. I'm wearing my Labor Day. This is as good as it gets for Western gear, but... 
Before he had this procession, there was criteria to meet. First, he had to be the victorious commander of a military campaign. He had to come back as a victor. Number two, he needed to return with at least 5,000 prisoners of war. And number three, foreign territory needed to be secured for the empire. If those three criteria are met, he's victorious, he comes back with prisoners of war, and he's claimed land for the empire, then this victorious general is, is worthy and deserving of a parade in his honor. And so first in line is it would come from the Temple of Mars, which is war, to, all the way to the, the capital of Rome. First in line, it, it would turn into a multi-day event where were various government officials, members of the Senate. Then there would be trumpeteers and, and those carrying the spoils uh, back uh, for the empire. Next were those that were destined for the arena, the captives, those prisoners of war. Then there would be more musical instruments. And then note this, there there's, would be Roman priests swinging large censers of incense. And in doing so, the whole, uh, the whole pathway, the whole city would, would have this scent of, of, of victory, right? And then following that was a chariot drawn by four horses with the victorious general himself. And then lastly, the general's men. The army would return decorated with their new uh, insignias and, and medallions and whatnot. And they'd be shouting over and over, triumph, triumph, triumph. Okay, so that's the picture that Paul paints in that one word, triumph, okay? And it's the same picture he uses, and you could jot this down in your notes. The same reference is made in Colossians 2, 15, about this victorious and following in this processional. And, and Paul says he sees Jesus as the victorious general, the captain of the Lord's army, who had come from glory to this foreign soil of earth and won a victory on Calvary. And he saw himself in the processional of all of that, of what Christ has done. He is part of the spoil of his master's victory. He is something that was won for the kingdom. And so he, he says, because I've followed the Lord's leading, the victor, I also, you also, myself included, we can walk in victory. Admittedly, he says, I was fearful, I was troubled, anxious, but I, I wasn't going through life in the midst of that, trying to find victory and just scrape it out. I have victory. That's the reality that Paul wanted and chose to remember, and that's the challenge for us to remember. We're in a place of victory right now if we are in Christ. And so now what Paul does, sorry if I'm speaking really quickly, but Paul progresses now from this picture of a parade to the incense that was used in the parade. And if we took ourselves, I described that whole processional, if we took ourselves back to the first century and we were sitting on the curb watching, you know, waiting for candy to be thrown out, watching this, you know, processional go by, and, and we could not only have this visual that, yeah, our general was victorious. Our commander was victorious. There would also be a scent. The, the fragrance of the incense was the aroma of victory, of life and victory. But to those who were defeated, those prisoners of war, that same incense meant defeat and death. So he says, thanks be to God who always leads us in this triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. That fragrance was knowledge. It was knowledge of victory for one side and defeat for the other. Paul says, we're the fragrance. We bring a message simply by our existence. For we, verse 15, are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. This is such incredible, vivid imagery that Paul is using here. He says, as we follow the lead of Captain Jesus... 
we're walking in the victory that he won. And everywhere we go, we're taking that knowledge with us that, that our God is king. Our master is victorious. And who he is, as I'm going through my life, who he is, what he's done for me, what he is doing for me, the salvation he's provided, the path that he's marked out that I'm living right now, all of that goes with us as we follow Jesus through life. As you, this weekend, Labor Day, as you gather together for a family gathering, or as we head back to the office or to the classrooms this week, wherever the Lord is leading us, we are taking with us the knowledge of Christ. And to those who are being saved, the aroma sounds a lot better than odor, doesn't it? It wouldn't quite have the same effect if it said odor. That aroma, wherever the Lord is leading us, that aroma is a blessing to other believers. Isn't it great when you, you realize that, hey, there's this guy I work with. He loves Jesus too. Oh, there's that bond there. It's a great thing. But those who are not in Christ, those who aren't following the leading of the Lord, those who are enemies of the cross, that same aroma of the gospel, it does become an odor. That Jesus you're talking about is repulsive. It stinks to me. The unsaved person is turned off to hear about what the Lord is doing in our life. Uh, yeah, okay, God showed you in the Bible. Great. Oh, you have a conviction. Okay, that's great. That same thing that oh, if I talk to a believer at work, oh, they're, oh, that's great. If I talk to the unsaved person, I could say the exact same words, and it has a negative effect. It doesn't have the same meaning. You know, this week... Um, really quick illustration I wasn't planning on. But this week, um, Jim Dennison got me this cup. It's Bluetooth, and it keeps my coffee warm for two hours, just sitting in there. Now, what I told him, to some might be, oh, that sounds great, and to others, oh, that's not great. I told Jim, I based the length of my sermons on the temperature of my coffee. Some are going to be saying, two hours of Bible study. Others are going to be saying that same message, two hours of Bible study. <laughs> we all have fragrances that we enjoy. Ladies, maybe it's a perfume, your husband's cologne, the smell of a clean house, whatever. Guys, it's like grilling meat. is like, And then it's just kind of different classifications of what meat you're talking about. But we all have these fragrances that we enjoy. But the, the source sometimes makes all the differences. There are smells that I love garlic. And I opened up a jar of minced garlic. I'll, I'll literally, I'll put my nose right in there and inhale. But if I smell that exact same smell coming from your breath, oh, that's not good. That's very, very bad. That's wrong. I don't ever want to do that. We, our life, your life, my life, it has a fragrance. And how you and I smell spiritually is dependent upon our relationship and our closeness and the proximity to Jesus Christ. If, if our fragrance smells a little fleshy, it's because we're not communing with him. In Mark 14, it says, Mary took an alabaster jar of spikenard, a very expensive perfume. It was probably her life savings. And, and you know, she, she broke it. And, and that was, she showed, I'm ready to give up everything for you, Lord. I'm ready to give up time, relationship, finances. And so in complete devotion to the Lord, she breaks the jar, she pours it out just freely, extravagantly, and then on, on the feet of Jesus, and then she uses her hair to wipe the feet of Jesus. And then in John chapter 12 is the other account of that same event. It says the entire house was filled with the fragrance. Mary herself would have had that fragrance with her for some time. It means that she smelled like Jesus. Her relationship with Jesus was inseparable. It, it let off this beautiful aroma. It was infectious. Everyone could smell it, but not everyone was impressed, right? The whole house smelled this great fragrance, but there were those, led by Judas, who represents the world, criticized her. What a waste. You have 
wasted your, your life savings on this. You've wasted your time giving it all to Jesus. That's the message that the world keeps telling us. You're, you're wasting your time. You're going too far with this following Jesus thing. Just show up once in a while, check in, check out, and be done. But, oh, man, you're always talking about Jesus. You're reading your Bible when you're not at church, on your lunch break, before, before work. You're going to church not once. You're going twice a week, maybe. You're, you're, you're plugging it. You're giving 10% of your income. The world says that is all of a waste. There's no point to that. But Jesus said, would say to that, and as he said to Mary, he says, she has done a good work for me. And so how we smell spiritually depends upon our closeness to Jesus Christ. And when we are at the feet of Jesus, when we are right there as Mary is always seen doing, the fragrance of Jesus has a way of rubbing off on our lives. For the, to the one, it's the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. We carry with us the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then Paul asks at the very end of, chat, of verse 16, and who is sufficient for these things? <laughs> who, who's sufficient to, to mark in the, march in the processional for the victory that he has won? Uh, who is sufficient to carry the fragrance of what he has done? This, this knowledge and message to the world. Who's sufficient for that? He's going to answer that in chapter 3. It's a, really an unfortunate chapter break here. But, but now Paul is going to defend his, his own ministry and call out those who are self-sufficient. For we, verse 17, are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. See, that's still hot. That's great. Paul wanted the Corinthians to know the difference between a peddler and a pastor. He wanted them to discern between his ministry of serving the Lord and the actions of those who are serving themselves, who came with their own agenda. A peddler is, is a huckster, right? It's, it's someone that's, it's a con artist. The word actually, and, I, and I th your footnote may say, it can be translated as adulterated. Now, purity is 100% of one thing, right? Adultery, the word means, this is what the word adultery means, it means to pollute, to mix. To, to something to make an impure thing. And so there were those in Paul's day, as there are in our day, a lot of preachers, teachers, wannabes, pretenders, polluting and mixing their own agenda with God's word. They're using the word of God. They're using religion to get rich, to pad their own pockets. Paul says, I never, ever did that with you. I taught in sincerity. And again, quickly, we talked about the word sincerity just a couple weeks ago. It means without wax. It means purity. Because uh, if there was ceramics, you'd, you'd take it and you're like, I wonder if this has any cracks in it. It's hard to tell. You'd hold it up to the sun to see if those cracks were covered by wax. If there was no wax, it, it was pure. And so Paul says, what we gave to you was genuine. It was pure. It was sincere. We didn't water down the word of God to, to, to try to, you know, uh, formulate our own agenda. And, and so peddlers, they're in it for themselves, but, but we... We, they don't have the fear of God, but we, he says, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. And there's an important reminder for us real quick. There's so many little great tidbits in here. Whether we are a Sunday school teacher, a Bible study facilitator, a worship leader, family devotions, any of that, the first audience, we speak in the sight of God in Christ, the first audience in your ministry is always Jesus Christ. It's always the Lord. A lot of other eyes may be on you, but the first set of eyes that matter, the only set of eyes that really matter are the Lord's. Now, he continues in chapter 3. And we're just going to go through chapter 5 today, so hold on tight, because my coffee's still hot. Okay. Chapter 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as some others, epistles, or it means letters, of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you, Paul had been accused of a lot of things throughout his ministry, especially with Corinth. It was a tense relationship, and, and they questioned his apostleship. I mean, are, are you really a genuine dude? I, you don't have a letter from Jerusalem 
Peter never really signed off, show us that he signed off on you and that you're, you're legit, right? And so Paul says, do I need a certificate for this? Verse, verse two, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. The incredible irony is that he's writing to a church he began, he started. They're saying, we need a letter. We need some sort of documentation to prove that uh, you are in the ministry for the Lord. Paul says, you need credentials to understand that God has called us to the work? Now, the equivalent for today might be an ordination. If you're ordained by this governing body, then you can be in ministry. Now, ordinations have their place. I'm not going to get into that. But a piece of paper is never what proves that God is using someone's life. The proof is in the pudding. Now, it's rodeo weekend. How many people have been to the rodeo? All right, okay, wow. There's a lot of folks here from the west side. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I don't want to embarrass you. Um, well, you'll understand why in a second. Uh, there's a lot of people that on this weekend act like cowboys, right? Maybe some of us are guilty of it ourselves. You know, I'm wearing a plaid shirt as, as far as I, as I go. But maybe someone has the boots and the hat. Maybe someone's got a buckle that they would never normally wear. Maybe even for this weekend, you see them, they got a big chaw on their, on their lip. Where's, where's your cattle? Well, I don't have any cattle. Not really. Do you, do you have a southern draw all of a sudden? Are you from Bremerton? You know, I. <laughs> where, where's your horse? Well, I, I don't really have a horse. I, I took the Prius here, you know. <laughs> what, what it's the saying? All hat, no cowboy, right? The proof is in the puddings. You might have and pudding. You might have all the things a cowboy has, but that doesn't make you a cowboy. There may be those going around and saying they're shepherds, but they got no sheep. And Paul says, an epistle of commendation. You want you want to see our seminary degree, a certificate of ordination. I was like, you are you yourselves are our ordination. That's, that's you. You're, you're, the, you're what validates this ministry. You've been born again. You're walking with the Lord. Look back to your life on, on what God has done. You're growing. There's fruit in your lives. This is, this is proof that, that I have ordained. People can look at you and see there's a change in your life. And God cares more about changed lives than framed documents. And so, verse 3, he says, look what God's done in you. S clearly, you are an epistle of, God, of Christ. Now, notice this. He's defending his ministry, but he doesn't say, you're my epistle. You're the epistle of Christ. Jesus has written your story. You're an epistle of Christ, ministered by us. The Lord used us, but he did the writing. Written not with ink, by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is of the heart. Our lives, Christian, your life, my life, is what is encouraging or discouraging people from following the Lord. The best evangelism tool. So, you know, sometimes churches have great outreaches and programs about evangelism. That's fine. That's fine. The very best tool for promoting Christ is the life of a Christian. Someone that's living, sold out, just all out for Jesus. That is the best advertisement, the best promotion for Christianity that you can have. Jesus said that the Christian who's living his life like that is like a city on a hill. You can't hide that. You cannot hide that. Your life is a message. And I'm sure you've heard it said before, but it's so true that your, your life might be the only Bible that someone reads. There's a lot of truth to that. And so students that are heading back, your life is going to have a fragrance. It's going to speak of something as you head back to high school, back to college. Let it speak of Jesus. At the office, Monday morning, well, it's a, it's a holiday, Tuesday morning, at the office, in the shop, at the job site, people are getting an aroma of your life, and they are reading you to see what you're all about, 
let what you're all about be Jesus. Let what he's done in your life just come off the page to them. Say, oh man, that guy's transformed. <laughs> That's incredible. And so what Paul is explaining is that Christians, followers of Jesus are letters of commendation or recommendation. Why should I follow Jesus? Why should I be a Christian? Our lives are what people are reading to see if the Lord is worth following at all. Let's make our lives real. Let's have that relationship real. Paul says, your life is all the validation we need. Verse 4, it's a couple more verses. And we have such trust through Christ towards God. Verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We're going to focus on the end of verse 6 the next time we're here. But before, in chapter 2, Paul asked, who's sufficient for this? To, to march in the processional, to, to carry with the, the fragrance of Christ, the fragrance of life. Who's sufficient for all that? How can we be involved in ministry? This is such an incredible thing. How can I be the aroma of Jesus, my broken me? How can I be a letter that others want to read? Any fruit, Paul said, anything of value that comes out of my life, he realized it's from the Lord. God is the one that enables you. Effective ministry is and always will be through the enabling of the Holy Spirit every single time. Dwight L. Moody, Dwight Lyman Moody, lived in the late 1800s. He was the son of a bricklayer. He didn't attend school beyond the fifth grade. Couldn't really spell. His grammar was terrible. He was an unordained shoe salesman for much of his life. But he gave his life to the Lord. He heard a message one time that changed his life. He says, the message he heard, the pastor said, the world has yet to see what God will do through one man totally devoted to him. And Moody said, I want to be that one man. I want that to be me. And so he, he left his shoe salesman business and he brought everybody he could to Sunday school and church and, and all that. And before you know it, he spoke before there was PA systems and, and, and radio and all of that. He physically spoke to millions of people at evangelistic crusades. And once after one of his messages, a seminary student approached him and said, Mr. Moody, I counted 18 grammatical errors in the first five minutes of your talk. I can relate. <laughs> Moody responded, young man, I am using all the grammar I got for the Lord. What are you doing with yours? We are not sufficient we are sufficient in the Lord. And so I think God will intentionally allow us come to the end of our own ability so that we might learn to trust in his ability and we draw from his sufficiency. We've got to see that we're insufficient first. Man, that's when ministry really takes off. And so these are just great reminders for us. We are triumphant in Christ. We're the fragrance of Christ. We are an epistle of Christ, and we are sufficient in Christ. And since those things are true, since we are triumphant in Christ, we can walk in victory. Since we are the fragrance of Christ, we are the aroma of life. And since we are an epistle of Christ, we will be read by all. And since we are sufficient in Christ, we can know that he has equipped us. Amen? Let's pray.